hello again. So we're uh, ready. Uh, welcome to RP Zero America. Uh, we've got our probe ready to go, and it actually timed out pretty well. So we missed the Venus window uh, while it was constructing, but we've approached the Mars window not too uh, poorly. Oops, no, don't roll. Okay, so currently it's rolling out. Um, warp two, sure, warp two. Um, so the time doesn't need to be perfect for a planetary transfer. Basically, if you, if you look back at the graph, um, the um, the plot, the plot program, um, that's the like that was the ideal time. Um, but you know you've got some windows around when that happens. Yes, indeed. Uh, close alarm, warp to complete. So fourteen hour or you know, practice we're doing it fourteen hours after that window opened. And I did uh, accept a Mars contract. Let's see, Mars flyby. So we've got a year, two hundred days to fly by Mars. So hopefully we hit it this time because this is our only window um, before that closes and we've only got the one craft. Uh, in practice, um, you know, historically, and for your career, it may make sense to um, build a couple of craft uh, beforehand. And in, in such a case, it is quite handy that um, a probe could go to uh, this. Basically, the same probe would be useful to fly by Venus, to fly by Mars, to do something you know, in relation to the Moon. Um, so, you know, that's handy. You could prepare a number of them before any of those windows, and you have them ready. So, if your first Mars um, probe is you know, perfect, you could send a second uh, probe to Mars to try to gather other science at the same time, um, or you could, um, you know, maybe double your chances of getting into orbit of it or something. Um, or you just have another probe ready to go, you know, that you could throw at Venus or at the Moon as well. Uh, so we need to, um, in practice, my pr uh, well, kind of my standard. Um, it's probably not the like precisely most efficient route, but um, it works every time, so I'm happy with it. Uh, I just launch into the plane of the Moon. Uh, so it looks like we're four degrees away from the plane of the moon. Um, we could probably get away with that, but because we're going interplanetary, I'm not going to, to risk it. I'm going to warp around until we are precisely in the plane of the moon. It looks like it might even be a daytime launch, which would be nice. So the inclination uh, maxes out. We're at the kind of the highest latitude um, that you can match the plane of the moon. And so uh, if you imagine it as a graph, you know, at the, we're kind of catching it at the peak, whereas a lower latitude would catch, would it would cross it twice, uh, would cross that graph twice, two times it would hit this, like perhaps at the equator as an example, or really any uh, launch sites f uh, more southerly than this relative to the equator, you know, between here and the equator. So we're coming back down to zero, so I'll have to pay attention to this during this launch because I want to stay pretty tightly into that window. Okay, so let's just do a quick save, uh, work back out, looks good. Yeah, we got a, a lovely uh, daytime launch right into the plane of the uh, of the moon. And from there we'll be in a, what's called a parking orbit, um, which we can uh, spend you know, the rest of our Delta V to shoot towards Mars. Alright, so yeah, it looks like the uh, craft is nice shiny metal. We do have the reflections plug in, it just doesn't really show up at night, which makes sense I suppose. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's really an unaltered probe, I'm pretty sure. Oh, right, I turned off the RCS so you can see uh, you were not seeing the... Um, oh, let me just grab this science because I want it to stop bugging me. I'll need to figure out a quick way to turn that on and off uh, sometime later. Uh, perhaps in 1.1. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right, yeah, see, it's just showing the delta V from my Atlas stage and my Agena B stage and not from the upper probe because I locked the tanks for that. All right, I should start pitching over. Uh, again, you know, just in case you don't watch all, all of my videos, uh, I usually uh, start pitching over at about 50 degrees, uh, like two degrees over or so, or sorry, at 50 meters per second, I start to pitch over. And then at that point, by roughly 30 seconds to a minute, it, I'll just kind of have eyeballed it that it looks like it's kind of come over enough. It's it's really just a process of experience with the craft. Just another reason why running simulations is a good idea. All right, so let's lock two and just, I feel like I, you know, I uh, was doing it a little late, so I will just um, pit, uh, stick to prograde, um, but with one extra degree down. And I can even um, do this. So it looks like we're, we're wandering off a little bit, but I'm gonna keep an eye on that value as we as we ascend. Uh, so I need to pitch over a little more, it looks like, 
because I, you know, just going to go with my my boilerplate one kilometer per second at uh, at the forty five degree mark, which is what I generally aim for. Mm -hmm. Ground looks kind of funny. Um, yeah, Nathan Kell uses different settings for this as well. Like he um, sets the terrain so that it kind of groups more, but I find that that looks really goofy around like sixty or seventy kilometers if you set the detail on like that the terrain detail distance. So basically, it's copy and pasting the terrain just um, in smaller smaller bits, um, and I find that you know that makes it look good near right near launch site when you're low down, but when you get a, a bit higher, it's very clear that it's just. Uh, the same pattern dabbed again and again and again, so I'm really wandering off of the ideal uh, latitude or whatever um, pitch things. <laughs> Apologies to people who remember the real terms. Uh, relative inclination is coming down, so that is good. Uh, coming down at a pretty good pace, and there, we're still pitched way too high for that, uh, for where we are right now, so let us. Here, I'll just manually go down. I'll just handle these manually because we're we're low enough that, or we've we've gone far enough that the dynamic pressure um, is, is is dipping. So I'm free to wander off of the prograde without the air slapping me down. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm gonna aim for roughly two minutes uh, to draw to drop it off. Sorry, at what at yeah two minutes ten seconds, two minutes fourteen seconds. It always seems like with the atlas that I pitch over too slowly, so this number starts to uh, become alarmingly high before I really get to uh, the altitude I'd like to be at. Um, rather, you know, basically, I, I tend to end up dropping it a bit early. Uh, that's why I'm pitching over more aggressively here. I'm not sure what the balance is. I think, given that I'm always pitching over too slowly, I should um, probably drop it off a bit earlier. Um, rather than kind of make this more efficient uh, right turn in the uh, at the edge here. Okay, atmosphere is coming down. Craft looks lovely. So let us drop off the clamshell. So now we can see the probe. And yeah, I've just locked the locked the tanks. So the hydrazine tanks are locked right now until we actually make uh, we'll need to make use of those. Which, depending on how efficient our ascent ends up being, we might end up um, wanting to use some of that hydrazine. For uh, like once the Agena burns out, we might still need a bit of delta V. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, hmm, two degrees, not terrible. Looks like it's not really getting any better. Um, so I'm just going to kind of pitch straight. So let's see, two and a half minutes to two uh, you know, of fuel left in the tanks versus two minutes to apoapsis. So not bad. It's going to go to about, um, I usually eyeball it, it's actually, it actually seems to be a useful rule of thumb if you, if you feel like you're kind of wandering a little higher than you want or you feel like these numbers are safe and you don't want this number to keep wandering higher, I just tend to go to about halfway between the orbital prograde and zero uh, for a little bit. I mean, having kind of a standard like that would probably be um, better than what my pro my ascent program does now. Or re re currently, I'm doing manually controlled ascent, but I have a separate video series where I'm working on a, a KOS script to uh, to ascend anything efficiently into orbit. And currently, it can get anything into orbit and remarkably efficiently. Uh, at least I feel that way, considering how purely automated and dumb it is. Like I'm only really feeding it two bits of data which are the velocity and time to apoapsis. That's really all that's going into the equation after like an initial gravity turn equation. And maybe I could just make adjustments to that gravity turn equation, but I've kind of got this ongoing experiment with it where I am um, trying to take it a bit further. I want it to know a lot more about the craft so I can feed it more intelligent variables. Mm -hmm. that looks good. Coming up, so the um, the cover I use, you know, the fairing I had is wide. Um, I believe that's because so the Ranger itself. Uh, this is kind of going to be like a Mariner or Ranger craft, which I which I have here from Shobs or Shobs, however you pronounce his name, um, from the KSP uh, Realism Overhaul IRC. He shared this craft, and so I'm using it because it is uh, very nice, efficient. It does everything you need to do, and it looks good to boot. Um, let's see. But the actual Ranger has two leaf of solar panels on each side, um, and they fold up. Um, and so 
they will you know, kind of unfold a bit once once you're in space and you're ready to go. Um, you actually you know, want to use the solar panels and such. And you know we don't really have somebody uh, in the realism overhaul team who is kind of focusing on infernal robotics and kind of balancing things with them because uh, it's it's kind of hard to figure out how infernal robotics should be balanced with realism overhaul. Like you know. If the Ranger has has hinges in like 1962 or in 63, um, it makes sense, I suppose, that you would also have that ability at the same time. Um, but that's also a really powerful technology, like because we don't really use tweak scale. It's hard to figure out what size hinges and what abilities should limit those things. So we'd need to do a bit of game um, figuring with that. So basically, you can't fold up solar panels that that specific type of way, like. Um, you would unfurl them from a ranger using something like Infernal Robotics. Mm -hmm. So we're approaching AP. Actually, here I should be around zero. Um, I've lost my relative inclination, which is not good. It's a useful guide. Come on, where the, where are you, Moon? Okay, so yeah, two degrees off, and so now I need to pitch up a bit to add more time to time to Apo, just to give it a little lob. Right now, like. With the Agena, it has a pretty decent um, thrust-to-weight ratio to start. Now, it may not seem that way to you, um, kind of depending on what you build yourselves, but um, a thrust-to-weight ratio of a second stage that starts at, w at 1 is, is pretty good in my books. Okay, very stable, so let's expend that first ignition to get to orbit. All right. Yeah, because right now I'm going to have to pitch up a bit to, to level this out to kind of s to halt our descent and then kind of reverse it a bit. Like I could pitch up a bit more right now, but I'm okay descending a little bit below 180. 180 is not too bad. Uh, really, you know, atmosphere begins again at 150, so as long as I stay above that, I think I'm, I think I'm fine. Uh, let's see about, no, that's not bringing that down. Okay, there, I bet that's, yeah, I need to kind of get on the other side of that pink, uh, the target dot. There we go. It's not going to bring it down a ton because we don't have a huge amount of thrust and um, we're probably not near the right kind of node in our orbit because you can't align two orbits uh, arbitrarily. It kind of has to be done near one of two points. The ascending nodes and descending nodes are important in that case, but you know, I'm not currently not eyeballing those specifics, so I'm really just experimenting, going to one side, looking to see if that reduces um, rinse repeat. And I eventually I want my script to my ascent script to do that as well because I want it to ascend to rendezvous. So I want it to take a measure of this value um, from however it needs to calculate it or, or gather it. And so it can you know, aim in on the same orbital plane as its target, because that's the most important thing in, uh, in a, doing a rendezvous. Have I done a rendezvous in this career? No, I, I did it in uh, some other videos, but not in this career. We haven't sent two things up to rendezvous. Mm -hmm. Ah yes, we're to coming down a little more than we want to. So it looks like we're gonna, you know, we haven't, we didn't um, do that ascent too poorly. So I think we'll have a good amount of fuel when we get to orbit. Not enough in the Agena to hit the target directly, hit Mars directly, but this um, upper stage has like 700 delta V or something like that in those locked hydrazine tanks, which I will unlock at a future time. Okay, so I'm just watching uh, vertical speed, it's starting to level off. Like, well, there's a lot of upper stages in reality that start move, either moving a lot slower, um, orbital speed has an impact, or having a much lower thrust weight ratio. So you truly have to lo lob it. So keeping an eye on giving it like literally a minute or two to apoapsis before it starts uh, to give it a head start to gather some delta V, increase its thrust to weight ratio by burning fuel is really key. Like an example of that is the Saturn IB. Uh, it starts at a quite low thrust weight ratio of like 0.6 or 0.7 or something like that. Okay, and we're pretty much there now. Let's see, so that, nine seconds out. Here, I'll just peg it to orbital prograde and that should be sufficient to park because we're pretty much there. So I'm just gonna wait till this is above 150 and then shut down the engines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely not the most uh, efficient ascent. I might actually try um, doing that programmatically because I'm, I'm with with just the um, 
I, I could probably have two or three hundred more delta V than I have there. So that's the first step of getting to orbit. Next step is um, maneuver planner. Um, let's just try a home and transfer to target. Why not? I'm going to try to select uh, Mars, wherever it is in the sky, and see what it does there. Mars, set as target, create node, uh, target, must be in the same sphere. All right, so I can't do that, so transfer to another planet, unset, set again, schedule the burn at the next, as soon as possible. There we go, create node. Uh, that's not too bad, actually. <laughs> this mode voids your warranty, nice. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's a pretty good um, option. Um, remember that when I originally planned this, I, with, uh, nope, wrong guy, there we go, uh, Mars, yeah, that's, that's pretty much the same number, that's good enough for me. And so we are going to be short um, 500 uh, meters per second of delta V, but we can make that up uh, with the probe itself, it has about 700 delta V. So I just need to open up those tanks and um, run that as well. So let us first... Uh, not execute next node. First I'm going to, while those tanks are still locked, um, I'm going to abuse persistent rotation because it is awesome for this. Just do a light pitch, let it rotate, and it gets me nice and near that. So that's just way more effective than you know what MechJab has to offer. Because MechJab will try to get there in a certain bit of time or something. Whereas, uh, whereas I, you know, there would be, it would be nice if you could tell it, you, we, I want to get to this position fast or slow. Because slow, really, you can just do with like a tiny RCS pulse in just the right direction. Okay, so it looks like I'm close there. And here we go. Cheat to kill the additional um, motion. Just turn on the SAS and jump time warp. All right, so we're, this is the direction we're going to want to be pointed for that burn. So I'm just going to do a quick save and tell it to execute next node. Hmm. Um, before I do that, I'm going to open up these tanks because I'm going to want to use this delta V right after because it's going to be most effective. Like use, um, expending your delta V or, or getting delta V, however you think of it, is done most is most effective when you're moving fastest. And in that, this case, that will be when we're closest to Earth. So that'll be right after we finish the Agena burn. And the Agena only has under 50 meters per second in this whole amount of hydrazine that it has, and so it's not worth really holding on to it uh, unless we just needed like the 50. Okay, so everything's ready. Crossing fingers and things. All right, so it's going to warp to just before this. Whoa. Um, oh, right, yes. Thank you for stopping time. Um, I mean, it's a very handy mod, it's just in a case like this, it's certainly not uh, ideal. Uh, create node, abort, abort node, execute, oh no, there we go. Ah, yep. It kind of borked that, lovely. Ah, let me close the Kerbal Alarm Clock. Oof, it's really wasting um, RCS. Um, oof. Let me uh, execute next node here. Let me get the aim in, and then set that up again. Yeah, see, MechJib isn't aware of persistent rotation and how it can how I can use it to cheat. Um, it sometimes turns on the SAS just a little too late before triggering time warp. Okay, execute next node. Yeah, and see, it's see if, as long as you're in the right position, it does things in that uh, that nice order of operations. Okay, so it is slowing down, so I gotta be ready to ullage this engine, um, settle the fuel here by pulsing my hydrazine jets forward. So currently unstable, pulse, pulse, pulse. Unfortunately it's wasting just a little bit of hydrazine in the probe itself. Come on, there we go, it's stable. Now just pulse it just a little bit to keep it stable, because pulsing forward all the time would, would waste fuel a bit. There we go, and it turned on the engine. I've got that real pluma uh, issue still, so I haven't really restarted. And there we go. So now we're just going to let it burn out all the uh, fuel it has, and then we have that remaining. Um, so let's see. Yeah, we burned a little bit of hydrazine. Um, it's not letting me transfer fuel, which, okay, fair enough. That would, I mean, that's clearly not physically plausible, so fair enough. <laughs> but yeah, it would be nice to fill up those tanks, just that little bit that we wasted. Mm -hmm. So what is the uh, what is the efficiency of this engine? So two hundred and eighty three seconds of ISP. 
Uh, and this one is not listing yet. Fair enough. Well, if this is showing up, I'm pretty sure I've got the right fuel. So it's going to have a lower thrust weight ratio, but way higher than if I just tried to pulse the um, the RCS on this, or tried to use the RCS on uh, RCS on that. So let's see, we're going from 285 to unknown. See, so yeah, it looks like we're still about 500 short on the Agena probe. I think in practice, the with the Mariner probes that they would you throw at Venus or uh, you know do flybys of, of Venus or Mars like this in reality, I think they just had a lighter probe, whereas I'm just kind of doing the, basically the same thing to throw things at the moon and try to get in orbit. Like I've got using the same thing to represent Mariner, Ranger, um, well not quite Ranger actually, I think, well Ranger covered a number of things, but this isn't going to, if I threw this at the moon, I believe the delta V in that would be sufficient uh, to get in orbit of the moon. There we go, and then dump you, um, abort node execution, Shut down engine. Hmm. Uh, abort node execution. There we go. See, it didn't, uh, for some reason, it didn't want to throttle that engine up, which I'm fine with. That's good enough. Now we're just going to run this until we get there. So that was almost enough to escape the system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it kind of caught on the moon. And so once it escapes the system, we can see it here. So the fa the more we burn, the further away from the uh, from Earth's orbit our orbit is going to be, until at some point it passes close enough to to Mars orbit that it's going to get an intercept. <laughs> no, it's not too bad. Like it's not definitely not the most efficient. Uh, route to use the specific tools I did, but it's it's really time efficient. It works really well, um, and ultimately I find I just have to build you know a couple extra dozen meters per second up to maybe a hundred, two hundred extra meters per second into a craft to do it this way rather than using a more precise tool that um, tells me say what orbit I should specifically launch into rather than like a lunar orbit, which basically is what I did there. Um, and in practice. Um, when it's actually showing, like that's the path it suggested, pretty close to a lunar orbit. That's, it's not always going to be that way. Uh, like I think one year I did, I checked the math and it suggested it would be like w way, way more delta V if I did it that way. And it probably would have been less delta V. So now I just killed that so I can actually see when this, uh, when we catch. So we're only going to have just a little bit of delta V. It's going to be a squeaker. Uh, there we go. So we got a Mars encounter. So now let me just pulse these to get a closer Mars encounter. Actually, let me focus view on Mars while we do that. So we can see how close to Mars we're actually getting. Not too bad. So we're currently 40,000 away. Whoa. Okay. So rather than using the main engine, let me just pulse the RCS. And actually, it looks like we're about as close as we're going to get without doing other maneuvers. So we'll set up a mid-course correction. And I'll do a little tweaking off camera because we should be able to get a closer buzz of Mars than that. Uh, like I'd like to be close to the plane of the planets because then I have a chance of flying by one of the planets, or sorry, one of the moons uh, as well to get, to get just a bit more science. And uh, yeah, I can get closer. It's just right now I can't do that by pulsing uh, my RCS just for, uh, forward and backwards from here. And so pretty much I'm going to set up a maneuver node um, all here. I already made that last video longer. I may as well um, do the same thing here. Well, no, I'm not going to show that on screen. I'd rather just show the planet recede. Um, but in principle, I'll give you a quick preview of what I'll end up doing. Uh, so around, let's say, yeah, an hour out from now, once we're starting to head away, I'm going to set up a, a maneuver you know, here, or further out, or even once we leave, uh, I usually do two course corrections, so like one not too far after we've left here, and I just use maneuver node editor and just kind of poke this in different directions to see what effect it has, and then kind of I stick with the craft until we get out in interplanetary space, and then set up another another maneuver node, uh, and then basically uh, do this like set up a maneuver node about halfway to the planet, and then basically do the same thing, poke these numbers until I get closer. Uh, really not that complicated of a science. That's but just this tool makes it useful. I don't have to think orbital mechanics too much. I just basically poke, 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 see which direction is kind of getting me good bang for my buck. Which one is getting me closer to the planet for the least expenditure of delta v? So it looks like if I make a correction in that direction, which 
just 5 delta V is going to get me that much closer. And let's see, that looks like probably as good as I can do. And because that's just an hour into the future, that's close enough that I can pretty much do the same thing here. <laughs> just slightly more efficient. So you see what I mean when I was saying that I really wanted to, uh, you know, do this correction to actually get the Mars encounter while I was close to the Earth because even now, like you can see, so my vertical speed, so the, the speed at which I'm leaving Earth is increasing rapidly and it's already pretty high and I'm approaching getting higher, that velocity is you know, getting slower because my gravity, um, it's being turned into escape velocity, you know, basically leaving the gravity while it's uh, converting my speed. So let me just poke it here, okay. so. I'm gonna just pulse this forward. Yeah, maybe it is actually a little better to do it an hour from now, but really it doesn't matter that much. I can just do it mid-course. Um, so I'll just end the video by showing Earth receding for the first time in this career series. So unfortunately the, the, the burn was in the dark, on the dark side of the Earth, but that's okay. There we go, while we leave we get to see the crescent of the Earth lighting up, and yep, that's not broken. That's showing how much speed we lose and how quickly we're climbing away from the Earth. And it looks like the moon was, I think that's the moon, probably the moon, it's on the opposite side. So in practice, you would want to, if you have persistent rotation installed, um, you'd want to kind of park your craft. Uh, I usually just kind of spin, let it spin until those solar panels are pointed toward the suns. And it looks like that's, uh, that's as close as it's gonna get without me spending some RCS to correct it, and that's good enough. So I'll leave it that way because that will keep it charged until I, you know, until I leave the sphere of influence. So thanks for watching. Uh, we have successfully got our first encounter with Mars. Next uh, video, I'm going to use the exact same craft and craft file to uh, get our first uh, encounter with the moon and perhaps get uh, craft into orbit. Basically the same craft. So thanks for watching. Goodbye.